I was good in the first service. I missed it in this one, but good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good. All right, we're going to be in Psalm 8. If you're not already there, turn there with me. Um, we're going to be talking about worship this morning. It's a super um, exciting topic for me. That's what I got my undergrad in at Liberty. I'm just passionate about it. Yeah, LU, all right. Who? LU people, yeah. All right, cool. I got friends in the audience. All right. Um, we're going to be talking about worship today. And uh, as we dive in, I just want to kind of share a quick story that is kind of a reflection of God's glory in action. Um, years ago, I got to visit Colorado. Uh, my best friend from high school was getting married, and he asked me to do his wedding, to officiate his wedding. And I was honored. I was excited for two reasons. Number one, because it would be a cool, exciting monumental day in my best friend's life. And I got to be a part of that. That was the first reason. The second reason was this Florida boy was excited to see some mountains. Uh, if you know anything about Florida, every single thing, it's just flat. It's just, as far as the eye can see, it's just flat. And my only real like references to mountains were the little tiny pictures in my geography book. Or like as you drive down the highway, the glorious Mount Trashmore right? It's like I didn't have any kind of reference to the size and magnitude of the Rocky Mountains. And so heading out to Colorado, I was stoked that I get to see that. And uh, I did spend some time in high school. That's where I met my, this friend of mine. His name's Corey uh, in Knoxville. And even there we have mountains, but they're just not quite the Rocky Mountains. And so I didn't know what to expect but we had high expectations. We hopped on a flight, headed out that way. And as we began to descend into kind of where the airport was, our um, pilot came over the speakerphone and said, hey, if you want to go ahead and put your window up, you can see outside, see the mountains on the right. I, I, I didn't know exactly what to expect. But as I lifted that window up, nice and slow, you know, I looked down. And what I expected was to look down on these mountains, but they were so massive that they were at eye level as we were descending down. So my first view of them was just these massive mountain ranges. Then days later, we have the wedding and we get to go kind of explore the area and we go up to Pikes Peak, which is probably the most famous uh, tourist uh, pike there in Colorado. And it's one of the tallest peaks in Colorado. And as we go up, we're, we're, you drive up this big thing and then you walk up, you take this kind of like trek up. Once again, had no idea what to expect, but as we came over this little ridge area and we got to see from the very top view, almost looking down, um, number one, I was a little frightened because you're just so high up, but I was enthralled. I just stood in awe that I'm on top of this mountain that God created and what stirred up within me, seeing the vast expanse of his creation, was how great and glorious our God is. It spurred me in an instant to worship. That's why when we sing songs about how creation is crying out in worship, that was a direct example of that. I do want to say the wedding went great. It, beautiful, having a wedding in Colorado, but I was overwhelmed uh, by God's creation. Um, and so Psalm 8, I kind of had a like mindset of what David says here at the start of Psalm 8, where he says, oh Lord, oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And so as we dive into this uh, series on Psalms called As Loud As He Is Worthy, centered around worship, we're going to look at the majesty of of our God. But if you came in today, I want to start off by kind of posing a question. Why is this important to me? Why is this important to you? Do I really need to be here and listen to another service or another sermon about worship? Well, here's the reality. This should be important to us because we all should strive to worship better. We should all desire to worship our God better. As we should, we have a longing to bring our very best to God, to bring our most authentic worship before him. We want to know God more and to glorify him. 
It's our very purpose in life. The Westminster Catechism put it this way. Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. The word of God, which is contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, is the only rule to direct us on how we may glorify God and enjoy him. Guys, we were created for this thing called worship. And this is what we, the church, will be doing for all of eternity. So yes, we should learn how to do it better because the truth is the majority of the time, if we're honest, we are terrible at it. We insert self where God should be. We reduce our worship to an hour or two once a week on Sunday mornings or Sunday evenings. We exalt preferences and performance. I can't tell you how many times, though it is flattering or, or sometimes convicting that people come up to the service after you know, our work, time of worship and they're like, man, today worship was just awesome. That song just hit. That worship set was just fantastic. You guys did such a great job. Like the music was really, whoa. It's like, that's great, but that should not be our priority. Our priority should be an encounter with God. A time for us to give him what he is due, which is his glory. So we exalt preferences and performances. I, I can't tell you how many times I have been convicted where I've walked into a church service and I've been robbed of a time of worship because they didn't sing the songs I liked. Or I felt like I had this powerful time of worship because they sang all the songs I wanted to sing. That has crept within our modern day church worship culture. We exalt preferences and performance. We are handcuffed by personal ability. Well, Ben, I, I don't really sing in worship because I'm not much of a singer. I'm pretty sure scripture says make a joyful noise. I don't think it says to make a joyful on pitch in harmony noise. I, <laughs> I think it's meant to be this heart's desire to cry out to our God. And if it's in pitch, great. If it's not, great. We are handcuffed by personal ability. We misplace expectations. We misplace priorities. We come in as observers rather than partakers. And as our mind's attention and our heart's affections should be fixed on God... We are elsewhere. Another possibility to be a little bit more personal is that honestly, worship for you has simply been difficult. Maybe you have found it hard to worship a good and perfect God because the current situations, the current circumstances that you're walking through are neither good nor they're perfect. Maybe you have seen unbiblical tensions rise around worship. Maybe you've come to a church and you're so fed up with all the arguing and bickering about what types of songs you sing, how we sing them, the flow of the service, and you're just kind of done with it. You just want it to be simple. Maybe your current pain is smothering your praise. Maybe, honestly, worship leaders have not done a good job modeling proper worship. Or it's as simple as you try to worship, but you just can't focus. Ben, I've got, you don't know what's going on in my life. I've got this happening. I have this, I have this stress, or I have, I have this happening at work. I've got this going on with my family. If you had just been in our car ride on the way over here to church, you'd know. Like, I'm, I'm just everywhere but here. Can I tell you today, you need worship more than ever. There's a submission that has, to, that has to happen where you say, God, I am going to right now give you my full and undivided attention and my full affection. But we're distracted. Or maybe you have simply lost the wonder in worship. 
Maybe it's been a long time since you've had that mountaintop experience of what I just shared about in Colorado where you've seen God in his full splendor and majesty and you respond in worship. Maybe it's been not just days, months, years, but maybe decades since that moment where you became a believer and you got to full, fully understand the mercy and grace of our God. That time was a long time ago, and so worship has dulled. Because I remember that day back in eighth grade when I surrendered my life to Jesus, I remember just being like overwhelmed that this wretch that I called my life would be saved by the mercy of God. And that this perfect God would love me and give himself for me. I was overwhelmed. I would shout it from any mountaintop. i go up to random strangers and be like, hey, do you know Jesus? Hey, do you know Jesus? Because I was just enamored with our God. And it wasn't hard for, for that to boil over into my time of worship. But honestly, that, that was years ago. And so maybe for you, you've kind of lost that wonder what we're going to see here in Psalm 8 is that we can all grow in this area called worship. And David's going to give us some clear calls to return back to the heart of worship, to understand that God is worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our attention. He is worthy of our affection. We join me in standing as we read this. It's going to be in Psalm chapter 8, starting in verse 1. This is coming from David. He's actually writing this for a choir. A lot of people don't know this. Dave, um, it's fascinating to study the choir of David. He had like a choir that was around, like a round clock choir, like 24 7. And I kind of imagine like walking into a space having your own background music. Sorry, this is like so not spiritual for a moment. But like imagine like everywhere you go, there's just people singing. Like I just think it's so cool. Now granted, he's joining in with them. But he just has this choir. So he'd write these psalms for the choir to sing and to exalt. And that's what we have here in verse eight. I'll start reading here in verse one. It says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over all the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the seas, whatever passes along the paths of the, of the seas. Verse nine, can we read this all together? O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let's pray together. God, as we dive into your word, as we look into these words of David, may we see your majesty. May we see your worthiness. May we be convicted if we've had hearts that have fallen away from proper worship. May we be convicted if we've lost sight of who you are. Today, call us back. Remind us of your glory. Remind us of your majesty. Spur us on in our worship of you. God, we love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Well, I think it's fitting as we begin a series on worship to simply answer the question, what is worship? There's not really one defined definition. There's been a lot of people that have put a lot of time and care into cultivating definitions, and I wanted to share one, one of them with you today that is pretty awesome, but um, worship is more comprehensive than this definition. But 
What William Temple says, the Archbishop of Canterbury, he says this, worship is the submission of all of our nature to God. It is the quickening of the conscience by his holiness, the nourishment of mind with his truth, the purifying of imagination by his beauty, the opening of the heart to his love, the surrender of will to his purposes. All this gathered up in adoration, the most selfless emotion of which our nature is capable. Man, I wish when I was in school, I could come up with something like that. I just, I didn't, I didn't have that up here. You know, I just, it just wasn't, wasn't there. Like I, I had it in part, but not in full. So I'm gonna give you my like brief summation. Doesn't really measure up, but worship is reflecting the glory of God back to him. That's what worship is. And a quick note for all of us that want to be better worshipers, here's, a, here's something to keep in mind. Our God is self-sufficient. And so no matter how you worship, no matter how good you are at worshiping, we don't add anything to his glory. What we do is we see the glory of God and we respond to it. In a way, it's like a mirror reflecting it back to himself. It's like, wow, we see all that God is and we proclaim it in the world. And we thank him for who he is. Worship broken down is worth-ship. The act of attributing worth to someone or something. And that could be done with anything, but biblical worship is simply a response to God. Declaring his attributes, his nature, his magnitude in attributing the proper worth that is due his name. We cannot know God's worth, much less declare it, unless we know it by what God has revealed to us. And there's two primary ways, there's more, but the two primary ways is he reminds us or reveals us through his creation and through his word. And so just a quick encouragement to you as you're trying to grow in your uh, Worship is to saturate your mind and your heart with God's word. Out of that revelation from his word comes worship. The more that we grasp his greatness, his power, his love, his character, his holiness, his righteousness, the more we understand his worthiness and the better we can declare it through worship. What Psalm 8 is preaching here is this. A church that worships God well knows God well. But also a church that knows God well worships God well. You see, David is calling out to God, giving the proper Worthiness do his name right here at the beginning. And so if we look at David's worship, I want to share two points that David's calling out. Number one, worship begins and ends with God. Worship begins and ends with God. Notice that verse one and verse nine say the same thing. I think it's that way for a reason. It's almost like, like book ends. That our worship begins and ends with God. He says, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Now, there's a significance to the words that he's using there because the names, as you can see, he says it twice, O oh Lord, our Lord. Those are twin definitions for the same name. The first one is Yahweh. So, O oh Lord, he is saying Yahweh. This is, he's referencing God as this covenant-keeping God. This is the same instance that um, when Moses asked who God is, he says, I am who I am. This is that God, that covenant God is Yahweh. The second thing that he sees is, he says, O oh Lord, our Lord. Well, that second name is Adonai which means master, and he's putting an emphasis on his sovereignty. So he's seeing God as this covenant 
promise-keeping God who is faithful in one hand, but on the other hand, he's also saying, God, you are also my Lord. You are my master. You are sovereign not only over me, but over all things. A church that worships God well knows God well, and a church that knows God well worships God well. And then he goes on to say, how majestic is your name in all the earth? Name here doesn't refer back to those, oh Lord, our Lords, but rather it talks about his reputation. It talks about his fame. It talks about his nature. So he says, how majestic is your name in all the earth? David here is acknowledging that God, as he has as it is in his heart and as his mind is fixed on who God is, David is demonstrating that God should be the primary object of our worship at all times. There's a uh, famous quote that goes around in worship circles quite a bit. It's from A.W. Tozer. And it says this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Our worship should begin and end with a proper understanding of who God is. To kind of put this into perspective, um, my wife, uh, Steph, we, we, we've lived uh, kind of in this area now for three months as we've been serving. And, and uh, imagine that you came up to me and you had just met my wife, Steph, at a coffee shop. And I think she's awesome, by the way, you know, but say you're like, man, I met your wife. She is awesome. She's just so great. And then you go on to explain this interaction with her. And then you begin to describe her to me. And you're like, man, she's just so awesome. And, and you describe her as like this brown-haired, green-eyed girl that loves to play frisbee golf and is an excellent violinist. That is not my wife at all. My wife has beautiful hair, but it's blonde. She has beautiful eyes, but they're blue. I have never seen her play frisbee golf. But, and also, I would love if she played violin, but that is not her forte. She plays soccer. That is like her thing. She's awesome at it. So, though the sentiment is lovely and appreciated, I would have to say, like, it kind of is unimportant, because it's based on inaccurate and incorrect information. And in my mind, I'd say, man, if you actually knew my wife, I think you'd like her even more. It's the same way with God. We tend to apply our own version of God onto God and then worship him for it, which is so dangerous. That's when we start to worship God because he's good, but not because he's just. That's because we worship God, or that's when we start worshiping God in part, but not in whole. It's a dangerous place to be. We should know God well because he calls us not only to love him, but to love the truth about him. And our primary source of that Revelation. Once again, it's right here in his word. So as you would study God's word, you would see like in Galatians 4, 6 and in Matthew 6, 9, God is Abba, Father. In John 1, he is Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning and the end. In Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, he is the ancient of days. In Genesis 1, 1 and in John 1, 3, he is Elohim, the creator in Genesis 22, he is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. In Exodus 15, 26, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer. In Exodus 6, 1 through 4, he is Yahweh. In John 1, 1, he is the word. In Psalm 90, he is our dwelling place. In Psalm 84, he is the living God. And the list could go on and on and on and on because our God's attributes are honestly unsearchable. And in scripture, they just apply these names to kind of point to specific things about God, but none of these, even in part or in whole, really sum up who God is. He is so much greater. 
But this is where we can start by looking at God's word and saying, God, reveal yourself to me so that I can worship better. So a church that worships God well, based on what David is saying here, knows God well and worships God well. British pastor Vaughn Roberts said it this way, worship never begins with us. It's always a response to the truth. It flows out of an understanding of who God is and what he has done for us in Christ. It begins with his revelation and his redemption. So we must ensure that the Bible, which contains the revelation and points us to God's work of redemption, stays right at the heart of our meetings, meaning our worship gatherings and our own spiritual lives. You know, worship doesn't begin with a band. Worship doesn't begin with a melody. Worship doesn't begin with music. Worship doesn't begin with, um, I don't know, an incredible bridge of a song like Christ Be Magnified. Though, I will say that bridge is pretty sick. Um, I, I, there's not been a point in my worship life that I've come in and be like, I don't really feel like singing that today. It's just that is a song that brings the best out of us because it points straight to the gospel and our need for it and how God is with us and he is faithful and he will carry us through to the end. But that's not where worship begins. Worship begins and ends with God first. First. Then we see our role in, that, in his story. Then we can see his grace, his mercy, and his characteristics on display in our lives. And we can worship him for it. But it begins and ends with God. Number two, David is saying here in Psalm 8 that worship responds to the glory of God. He says here at the end of verse one, you have set your glory above the heavens. If you are a person that takes notes in their Bible, I would just underline that. That's a really strong statement. Glory meaning the weightiness of God. This is God's nature. This is his attributes, all of them wrapped up into one in the weightiness. Um, one theologian said the prominence of God and who he is and we worship him for it. J.D. Greer puts it this way. The Hebrew word for glory, kabod, literally means weight. And so to give something glory in your life or to worship it is to give it so much weight that you couldn't imagine doing life without it. So whatever you give weight to in your life, you glorify Is that said of God in your life? Or have other things crept in in taking their seat? Everybody in the world worships. The rich, the poor, the religious, and the irreligious all give reverence, courtesy, and ascribe worth to someone or something. Every religion is based on worship. Every life is based on worship. Every desire is based on worship or something or someone. You ever notice that no one has to force you to worship and love things that you already worship and love? I think of like, um, I talked about earlier when I went to Colorado, uh, the coolest part of the trip was going to Pikes Peak at the top. Once again, the wedding was fantastic. But once we got to the top of the mountain, it was like the most incredible thing. But to get there, I had to do this like long trek and hike. And for some of you, you're like hiking people, especially here in Charlottesville, like there's a lot of people that love to hike. Ah. It's not really my thing. I have no desire to like wake up early in the morning, get dressed, go to a specific spot, park a car, hop out, trek up a mountain, and just to go, wow, this is awesome. And then to trek back down. Like, some of y'all, kudos. It gives you life, and I'm so thankful for that. For me, 
It doesn't. Like, it just, it just doesn't. And so for me, if you're like, hey, Ben, let's go on a hike. No, because I have no desire to go on a hike. But if it's something that you love, once again, kudos, if it's something you love, you wake up early in the morning, you're excited, you put your stuff on, you hop in the car, you go down, you can't wait. You're asking people to come join you. Hey, come with me on this hike. It's like a really cool thing to do. All right. Uh, <laughs> But you know what I'm saying? Like, because you love it, it's not hard to do. I think of like, come this November, all you guys that love to hunt, all of a sudden you're gonna see all these guys that like have been late to school every single day that semester or like been late to work all the time. But come hunting season, they're up before everybody else, got all their stuff on, got their stuff ready to go. And like, all right, we're gonna go hunting. You know, it's because they love it. Same thing, like my dad loves to fish. I love to afternoon fish. And he's like, fish aren't out in the afternoon. So we're waking up at like before the sun's up and getting out there to go fish. But why? Because he loves it. Because it's life-giving to him. We're that way with things that we worship. But a lot of times in our worship and fear of God, it can be a struggle. It can be hard. Some of you guys, just coming here was a struggle. Ben, you don't know the conversations we had in the car. You don't know, um, you know how difficult it was to get up here. And, and your expectation at this time is kind of jacked up because you're coming in kind of to check a box and be like, all right, we're here. We're here for worship. We should come with the expectation of meeting with God and we should be excited about that. More than anything else in your life, you should be excited to give God praise. Not because Ben said so, but simply because he is worthy. When we have a proper view of God and we see his glory, the only thing we can do it's what David does here where he says, oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Whatever we give weight to in our lives, we glorify. We see this in our world. Some of the biggest cities in our country put on display what they worship by the biggest buildings in that city. Think of Boston, all, the, all their biggest stuff is all about education. It's all about how smart you can be. New York, it's the financial district, all the tallest towers of skyscrapers. How much money you could have. In Washington, D.C., it's all, all the government buildings. How much power you have. In the same way, we can see what we worship in our lives by what, by what gives the most value, time, and attention. Our problem is that we ascribe worthiness and devotion and affection to the wrong things. Do y'all remember that story from 2 Samuel chapter 6? Um, David and like 30,000 men were... Um, setting out to go reclaim and take back the Ark of the Covenant. And they go and they're successful and they return back to the city and they're all excited. Everyone's really excited, but David is like on this whole other level. Like he is like crazy. Like he is, the word that is used in scripture is undignified. And so that's like a really like popular word in church nowadays because of uh, David Crowder wrote a song about it. But back in the day, but what that means is he was just honestly beside himself. In view of God and his worthiness, he just could not contain his excitement. And as a kid, it was just always funny to like hear about a guy like dancing in the street naked. I don't know why that's just funny to me. But here's the problem is I always find it puzzling how grown men will be like an undignified David for their sports team on Saturday and be like a bump on a log before, oh Lord, our Lord, on Sunday. We have ascribed worthiness to the wrong things. And I'm not saying that sports are a problem. I am a huge sports fan. I grew up playing it, 
enjoy watching it, love the game, football, basketball. I struggle with baseball. It's just a long thing. <laughs> but I appreciate it. But not as much as I appreciate God. And it should never take the place. So some of you, this is like a, a sharp message to you about worship, but I'm gonna transition for a moment. Maybe you've got kids in sports leagues and you notice, wow, we've missed like 20 Sundays this year because we've been off doing sports leagues. I think that shows a little bit of priorities. God deserves that spot no matter what. God deserves our full affection, our full attention. What we give our time and our resources towards shows what we value, shows what we worship. So here, David goes on, and what he's going to do is he's going to share a couple ways of how God reveals his glory, how God has revealed himself to us so that we can better worship. So the first thing that he jumps into is, number one, God reveals his glory in justice. Verse two, look at it with me. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. To sum that up, what he's saying is glory in the mouths of the weak, humble the mighty. It reminds me of many times in scripture where instead of the, the strong prevailing, it's the weak with God's help that God is able to show his glory through the weak being made strong. I see this verse as one of many in scripture that reveal God's delight in empowering the weak to overcome the strong. And actually this part of Psalm 8 is found somewhere else in scripture. It's actually found in Matthew 21 when Jesus goes and he cleanses the temple because they've defiled it, they've brought improper worship into the temple. They've made it basically like a bartering area where they're just like selling goods and they're trying to make profit off of things that are supposed to be God's. He says this, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. Look at verse 14. This is where we're gonna see Psalm 8. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, saying, and Jesus said to them, yes, have you never read, here it is, out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. When Jesus quotes this verse in this context, he's understanding the connection between worship and righteous justice, that these children were exalting praise amidst darkness. Notice that the chief priests here were indignant. And so some of the very first axe blows laid to the root of a dead and hypocritical religion that was happening at that time were made by the worship of children. Verse two, which seems like it's a bit out of place with the whole rest of the psalm, actually points to a really strong truth. That part of humanity's role when carried out properly involves personal and corporate worship pushing back the darkness. This applies to both the strong and the weak. God calls to battle, extends to all of his people. Young and old, physically strong and weak, it is a unique army that God has armed himself with by his spirit. I think of the story of Gideon and Judges where they get this whole army together and they think that 32,000 would be enough and the Lord says, no, it's too large. So they trim it down and they get down to about 10,000 and God's like, it's too large. So then they trim it all the way down to 300 and that's the right number because then no one can mistake that this was God's work that this would present the glory not to these 
32,000 men, not to these 10,000 men, but these 300 men, there's no way this can be done without God. And so all the glory went to him. I also think about this in the story of the gospel. God's people at the time thought that this savior that was promised to them would come on like through the clouds on a white horse with the sword to smite all of their enemies, but rather Jesus came in the form of a baby. But from that baby, Jesus, who would live a perfect life, die our death and raised from the grave, defeating death forever. That, was, that humility that God put on display just showed that all the glory goes back to God. Number two, God reveals his glory in creation. He says, you have set your glory above the heavens. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. David is acknowledging the greatness of our creator. And I think that he chooses this wording very, very wisely is he actually says that he's doing all of this creation by his fingers. He says, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, it's not like he's saying, God, look at what you've done by pulling up your bootstraps and getting all your muscles and all your might together to make it happen. He says, no, as I look at this great expanse, you've made it happen by your fingers. Tim Keller says, David saw God's greatness in the universe around him. This view of God's creation makes him the most important figure in our lives. When we see the world as a display of God's wisdom and joy, it changes how we understand everything. I just think of our universe. One of these galaxies in our universe, which is there's billions of them, one of these galaxies is called the Milky Way, and it measures 10,000 by 100,000 light years. In this galaxy are millions of stars, and one of them is called the sun, which has a diameter of 860,000 miles. Around this sun revolve several planets. One of them, which is 93 million miles away, one of them is called the Earth, which is 8 million miles in diameter. David is looking at the universe and saying, God, you have created this with your fingertips. All the universe points to the majesty of our creator like an artist's signature. And so number three, God reveals his glory in us. God reveals his glory in justice, in creation, and then in verse four through nine, God reveals his glory in us. It says, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the seas whatever passes along the paths of the seas. And so what we have here is we have this idea of David who has looked at the great expanse of the universe and has said, God, wow, how majestic is your name? And then he kind of is looking up and then he's looking out. He's looking at all of creation and says, wow, you have created all of this with your fingers. So he looks up, he looks out, and then he finalizes his time of worship by looking in. And he says, wow, in comparison to all of these things, I am insignificant. What is man that you are mindful of him? You ever just sat and paused at the, the God who created the cosmos thinks fondly of you, that he knows the number of hairs on your head, that he knows what your week was like this week, what your week's gonna look like next week. He knows you, he knows your kids, he knows your family. He knows the stresses you're in. He knows the pain you're walking through. And David is here. I mean, David went through a lot of stuff. And so some of that emotion is coming out here. God, as I look at this cosmos, as I'm here worshiping you, how, 
How do you even have time and thought for me? This insignificant thing. Then he goes on even further and says, not only are you mindful of me, but you've given me tasks, you've given me work, you've given me dominion, you've given me a purpose. Our God is thoughtful. And it says in verse five, yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. So not only is God mindful of us, not only does he give us dominion, but he crowns us with glory and honor. Which is so interesting because it feels like we walk around just trying to put our own crowns on our own heads. Our staff thought it was kind of funny. They kind of came up with this idea that it's almost like we're, we're, we're you know those Burger King crowns? Man, I used to love those things when I was a kid. We drive so far out of the way, not even get Burger King, just to go in to get a Burger King crown. And that's what it feels like in our lives. Like God is here saying, I have this crown of glory and honor and it is for you. And yet we're over here messing with some Burger King crown. That has no insignificance, no weight, no worth. When we understand that we are crowned with glory and honor from God, that glory of God can be an anchor for our self-image because we're all trying to build our image on something. Everything else apart from God is fragile. Try to build your life on looks, those looks are gonna fade. Try to build your life on friends. We learned this just not too long ago. Friends are gonna let you down. They're gonna fail you. So will family. It's gonna let you down. We try to build it on accomplishments. Those are gonna fade. On money, it's not gonna go with you when you die. Everything else falls short. And God is here saying, I have a crown for you. That should spur us on to worship. That should spur us on with a heart of thankfulness and gratitude. And so to be better worshipers, our worship must begin and end with God and our worship must be a response to his glory and it must include us understanding that he is mindful of us. That he has created us to worship Here's the thing. Jesus Christ took on a crown of thorns so that God could give you his crown. Psalm 8 is found in one other area in in the Bible, one other passage, and it's in Hebrews chapter 2. And that chapter is summarized by founder of our salvation. I'm gonna read some of it. Now it says, for it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. Here it is, the Psalm 8 reference. What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not see yet, seeing everything in subjection to him. Look at verse nine with me. But we see him, meaning Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. We worship God simply because he is worthy, but we also worship him because he cares for us. He is worthy of our affection. He is worthy of our attention. And if Psalm 8 
is an x-ray into the worshipful life, I want to point you to Psalm 115, which is almost like an autopsy of a corpse. Psalm 115 speaks of these pagan nations that had left God. It says this, their idols are silver and gold. They work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not um, hear. They have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk, and they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. Psalm 8 is a psalm of hope. It is a psalm of praise. And Psalm 115 is the inverse what a life looks like without putting God first. May our worship be deepened by a greater understanding of the majesty and glory of God and his redemption. And today, I, I pray that you would do like David and go macro to micro. As we seek to put God first in our worship, let's start with the macro, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And then from there, we look at his creation. We say, wow, God, you have created some amazing things. All of creation is pointing to your worth and your worthiness. We see your artist's signature everywhere we go. Not just in places like Colorado, but even in our families in our homes, in our workplaces, in Charlottesville, in our community. I pray that that leads us to see his glory within, that God has great things in store for us and he calls us to worship him deeply. Let's pray together. God, as we go to prayer, a verse sticks out to me. O oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul. My Savior God to thee, how great thou art. God, you are worthy of our full attention. You are worthy of our full affection. Not just because of what you have done, but simply because of who you are. You have set your glory above the heavens. And now as we look inwardly, God, we just rejoice in thankfulness that a God that is above all things is mindful of us. May we remember today that you are worthy of our worship. And as we come into your house for worship, set our hearts in proper view of who you are. Set our posture of worship correctly. God, you are worthy of it all. God, we love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.